order, and it's time for questions to the Minister and Deputy First Minister, and I call Mrs Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number one. Call the First Minister. Permission, and I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The issue of clerical abuse, I want to say from the outset, is no less important or emotive than institutional abuse. And we are mindful of the equally destructive impact that it has had on many individuals. <clears throat> Apologies, Mr. Speaker, I have a bit of a flu, and it's the man flu, which is the most virulent variety. So, uh, apologies for my voice. The Health Minister has healthily provided a range of detail on the services that are available. We have the Domestic and Sexual Violence Helpline, a 24 hour service providing the key support, the advice, and the signposting for victims of domestic violence. We have Nexus NI responding to the needs of adults who have experienced sexual violence and abuse through the provision of counselling services. We have the Rowan Sexual Assault Referral Centre providing services in the aftermath of a sexual assault, rape, or an incident involving childhood abuse. And that includes a 24-hour advice and information line which anyone can ring. And then there are a range of psychological therapies and counselling covering a wide spectrum of services, both within the statutory and within the voluntary sectors. In terms of uh, primary care, uh, talking therapies, hubs, we're looking at establishing these across the five health trust areas. In fact, they're, they're currently being established. And that's going to provide a range of psychological therapies and lifestyle support for people that are experiencing common uh, mental health problems. Again, I call Mrs. Dobson for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the junior minister for his lengthy answer, despite his, his man flu? Um, but can I ask, in what sense is it fair and equitable that two boys may have been abused by the same person on the same day, but only one has access to the HIA inquiry? not based on the nature or scale of the abuse, but merely where it happened? I think the member, uh, and this whole House supported the terms of reference of the historical institutional abuse inquiry. And it is a difficult because any child that has suffered sexual abuse, and I saw it over two decades of professional practice, the impact on children is exactly the same. Uh, they'll differ individually as to how they respond to it, but the trauma is the same. So whether you've been abused by a teacher, by a somebody in the clergy, or you've been abused in an institutional setting, the, the difficulties, the psychological traumas that reverberate from that in post-trauma, uh, while will not hit every single individual victim, will respond the same way, but the trauma is particularly difficult. Why this House chose, and I think chose correctly, to set the terms of reference in the way they did for the historical institutional abuse inquiry was because these children did not have uh, parents or caregivers to go directly back to. They, they had nobody else. They found themselves in a situation where their primary care uh, was being provided in this setting and uh, the inquiry is looking at abuse that occurred within those settings. So that was the rationale for it, and I believe this House chose correctly when it set that rationale for the historical institutional abuse. I think it's absolutely vital that for all of those other people who experienced abuse in a range of settings, many within their, their, their own family homes by people that they knew, that we can provide them with the best service uh, available to put them on the process uh, of healing. And I have talked to many of the victims and survivors over the last number of years who are making a hugely positive impact uh, on society, and we need to ensure that the care and support that's needed uh, to help that healing is provided for them at the point of need. Thank you. And I call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the junior minister if he welcomes the UK Home Affairs Committee recommendation that Kinkora Boys Home allegations be included in the UK independent inquiry into child sex abuse and the recognition that the committee gave to the united position of this assembly that that should be the case? Yes, the, it's an important 
a critical issue, the, the question uh, in relation to uh, Kinkora and the Westminster position on the historical institutional abuse inquiry rule. I know the First Minister uh, met the Secretary of State specifically uh, on this issue, and the member correctly refers to the fact that on the 30th of September, the Assembly unanimously agreed that the allegations of cover-up by intelligence services and MI5 relating to abuse in Concorda Boys Home should be investigated by the Westminster Child Sexual Abuse Inquiry. And we are naturally disappointed that the, the Home Secretary uh, did not do it. But we are pleased that the Home Secretary and the Secretary of State are fully committed to a full investigation into any and all aspects pertaining to abuse at Kinkora Boys Home by the inquiry into historical institutional abuse here. On the 8th of January uh, 2015, the HIA inquiry received a written undertaking from the Attorney General, the Right Honourable Jeremy Wright, QC MP, that any evidence presented to the inquiry relating to a matter within its terms of reference will not be used in any criminal proceedings against the person providing the evidence. The letter specific, states specifically that, for the avoidance of doubt, the undertaking covers any allegation of an offence under the Official Secrets Act. So the chairperson of the inquiry here is also satisfied that the assurances that he has been given will allow him to investigate all aspects of Kinkora fully, even if they relate to evidence outside this jurisdiction. Um, so I hope that answers the member's question adequately. I call Mr. Ali Gatwood. Um, even since the last uh, oral question time, FM, DFM oral question time, the voice of victims and survivors has become stronger that, at the very least, there should be a scoping exercise done in respect of financial address. Indeed, I believe that many victims and survivors will be meeting with church representatives this very Wednesday in Armagh, and that will be a point that they will press the churches on. In those circumstances, is it not the time for FM and DFM to pivot, to respond to the voice and the growing voice of victims and survivors, and to begin to scope out financial redress? Well, I, I'm not sure why the member refers to FM and DFM, given that the terms of reference uh, for the historical institutional abuse inquiry were set by this House and by all the parties here, including his own party. And at that stage, uh, we, we sought to do and put in place what we now have. Um, and what we asked at that stage was that the inquiry would be allowed to complete its work. Victims and survivors asked that the inquiry would be allowed to act independently. So we have, we have given it to an independent chair, a very distinguished chair, as a member would know from his previous uh, career, and that uh, the independent inquiry would carefully examine the evidence uh, and report that evidence back uh, to ourselves. And the House agreed with uh, all of those terms of reference, and all the parties agreed, that at that stage, then, when the inquiry was concluded, and having heard the evidence, and, and let's be clear, evidence is still being heard. Um, and when the inquiry included, and all the evidence had been heard, then the chair of the inquiry would make a recommendation to the executive in terms of redress. And that's the position that has been adopted, and that's the position that we will be dealing with. And before we move on, can I inform members that questions six and seven have been withdrawn? And I call Mr. Dahi Mackay. Oh, question number two. Mr. Speaker, the Executive's international relations strategy sets out a clear framework <coughs> for our engagement internationally over the coming years. It aims to enhance Northern Ireland's international credibility and to develop mutually beneficial relations with targeted regions around the world, securing investment, improving trade and attracting tourists, and international students here to Northern Ireland are key to this strategy. Our offices in Brussels, Washington and now Beijing play a major role in our international outreach. The work of the Washington Bureau 
is establishing and developing important relationships with senior U.S. government representatives and has been integral to invest Northern Ireland's unprecedented success in attracting U.S. investment here. The Deputy First Minister and I are looking forward to meeting with key decision makers and business executives when we travel to the United States next month to highlight the benefits of a competitive rate of corporation tax. Our relationship with China represents an exciting opportunity for Northern Ireland. The Beijing Bureau opened for business in September last year. We are already starting to see the benefits of direct government-to-government -government relations in the work of Invest Northern Ireland, the agri-food industry and third-level education sector. The Chinese government's plans to open a consulate general in Northern Ireland based in Belfast are at an advanced stage. This is further evidence of the growing confidence and mutual understanding between Northern Ireland and China. Within the framework of our international relations strategy, the Deputy First Minister and I will continue to promote Northern Ireland as a great place to do business and to visit. And I call Mr. Dahi McKay. Can I welcome the work by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to attract investment, create employment uh, and to tap into the, the, the correct markets internationally. Uh, could I ask the, the First Minister, could he provide us with an update on the work of the International Relations Working Group? Well, Mr. Speaker, can I say that, that we have both uh, an international relations strategy uh, and we are wanting to make uh, an international development statement. In terms of international development, uh, I think there is much work that has to be done, uh, and we are working with the committee in that uh, respect. The International Relations Working Group, uh, it was established, I think, in, back in July of uh, last year as part of the executive's uh, strategy. Uh, each executive <coughs> department is uh, represented on the group, uh, its aim is to coordinate the international activity of ministers and departments uh, in order to develop a corporate approach. This includes establishing communication links to uh, best share information, coordination of future international travel and diplomatic events, and agreeing a set of uh, key corporate uh, messages. Uh, it continues to work, uh, and we continue to improve our international relations. In international relations, can I say, we not only use the uh, fixed offices that we have uh, with the Bureau in Washington uh, in uh, Europe uh, and now the office in Beijing, but we also avail of the opportunity uh, to use the uh, various Invest Northern Ireland bases around the, the world and where necessary embassies. I call Mr Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the First Minister for the answers he's given so far. Could I ask the First Minister, does he believe that the Executive could better harness the UK presence across the globe uh, to promote Northern Ireland internationally? Well, I, I think the, the, nobody can do it better than ourselves, and I think that's why in the key areas uh, we have uh, got our, our own offices set up. Uh, in terms of uh, investment, I think clearly there is a, a massive advantage in using Invest Northern Ireland's facilities, uh, and we do that right around the, the globe. Uh, I think everywhere that we go, we do visit the, the embassies wherever we are. Uh, we seek to discover the extent to which they have uh, promotional literature uh, that uh, helps Northern Ireland. It is not always the case, uh, and perhaps we should be paying more attention uh, to ensure that all of the embassies at least have the, uh, the, the various documentation that they need in terms of investment strategies uh, or indeed information on our educational and other sectors. Uh, so it's not simply a case of uh, the embassy selling Northern Ireland. We need to be selling ourselves to the uh, embassy. And I think it's useful if any of our members are uh, on any foreign uh, journey, they should call into the, the embassy in that area and just discover for themselves uh, how much that embassy is doing to tell the story of Northern Ireland and report it back to us. Comes to John Dallet. Mr Speaker, I thank the Minister for, for his answer. Would the Minister agree with me that in developing international relations, we should have in place a cohesive policy in relation to international development? And can he tell me why, after so many years, this Assembly has yet to bring forward a policy in relation to how we approach the third world? And I ask the question in the knowledge 
that Northern Ireland accepted millions of pounds from donor countries to rebuild our own society. Why have we not a policy in place towards the third world? Well, uh, of course, uh, we do work with uh, the, the government in terms of uh, international development, uh, and we have uh, an assembly group <coughs> that uh, also looks at uh, international development. Uh, I have to say that uh, I think there have been some changes in that group. We would want to continue to work with them. But we are working on uh, an international development statement. I expect that to be coming uh, forward uh, fairly soon. Uh, because no matter what we say about uh, how difficult times are in Northern Ireland, there are shades of poverty. Uh, and uh, if people think that uh, we are having difficult times and that there are people in poverty in Northern Ireland, there are other parts of uh, the globe that they should visit or look at, and they will see the massive need that there is uh, and in a, a region that uh, has a, a, a relative abundance, uh, we do well to remember those who are in much greater need than ourselves. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Developing uh, corporation tax setting powers is a key commitment in the programme for government, as a wide range of evidence has shown that there is significant economic benefit to lowering the rate in Northern Ireland. Uh, while the legislation to transfer responsibility for the tax continues to progress through Parliament, consultation events are being held with key stakeholders in respect of the technical aspects of the bill. We remain confident that the legislation is on track to receive royal assent before the general election. Further preparations to reflect the changes in the legislation will then be required by HMRC and tax software suppliers so a reduction in the rate will not be introduced until at least uh, April of 2017. However, as we already have a very strong talent pool, the economic benefit will be seen in advance of this date as indigenous companies and inward investors will increase their investment levels in anticipation of a rate reduction. Thank you. And I call Mr Anderson for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for his answer. Uh, First Minister, you have touched on, on uh, the possible date uh, for the legislation for incorporation tax, but can I ask you when you would like to, to see the corporation tax become effective? And I can also ask you uh, what you would, uh, should think that rate should be. Well, the Deputy First Minister and I have met uh, with the Chief Executive of Invest Northern Ireland uh, and with people from the Department of Finance uh, and Personnel. It is very clear from an Invest Northern Ireland point of view uh, we would waste a massive opportunity if we were to wait until the 1st of April 2017, which would be the date when it could be in force in Northern Ireland. But the potential for us to sell two years without any cost to our budget would be lost if we were to wait until then. So I think uh, the advice from Invest Northern Ireland is that we decide as soon as possible what the rate should be, what the date should be, uh, and to give a clear commitment that it is for a long term that we are intending to keep that uh, level of uh, corporation tax. Uh, the, uh, the indications are, happily, uh, from the, the last briefing that we have been given, that the fear previously was that uh, we would be faced with uh, a bill of something in the region of uh, £325 million uh, for the first year of its operation. It is now clear that this will be phased in over three years uh, with a uh, likely reduction from our block grant of about, uh, well, between 100 and 150 million pounds in the first year. That makes it much more doable. Uh, it means that uh, we would not be facing the uh, final and larger figure uh, until about 2019-20, uh, which is at the, the same time uh, as the Treasury forecasts and modelling would suggest that we should be coming out of the period of austerity uh, and at the same time when we would be getting the full benefit of the changes that uh, under the Stormont House Agreement are being made in terms of streamlining our services and the costs here in Northern Ireland, which would put us in a much better position to uh, be able to uh, endure that reduction uh, in our block grant. I call Mr Danny Kinahan. Mr Speaker. Um, 
I wonder if the First Minister were to look at the three programme for government milestones and outputs with regard to the commitment for corporation tax, he'll see that the 2012-13 uh, one needing a government decision through participation in the Joint Ministerial Working Group didn't happen, that the 2013-14 one to ensure that we required Westminster and Assembly legislation in place didn't happen, and that the 2014-15 need for an executive announcement on the rate didn't happen. So, in fact, we've had nothing but fail, fail, fail. We need to see corporation tax. Will things change? And will we see a better and more dynamic approach? Well, of course, the decisions on all of these matters were ultimately decisions uh, of Her Majesty's government. They were not decisions of the Northern Ireland executive. Uh, however, it was his party that gave up. His party surrendered on the issue. His party leader was standing in this assembly telling us to move on, forget it, what's plan B, you're not going to get it. Uh, and uh, it was this party that stood by its commitment. It was this party that continued to try. It was this party that succeeded in getting the commitments from Her Majesty's Government. And it would be much better standing up in this place and congratulating us uh, for what we have achieved rather than emphasising the fact that he failed because he was the one that walked away from a commitment to get corporation tax for Northern Ireland. And I call Mr Basil McRae. Would the First Minister consider corporation tax to be a volatile tax? And if so, what safeguards will be put in place to make sure that if there are large swings on an annual basis, that we will be able to meet our commitments? Well, I think the, the Treasury uh, will recognise that there is volatility in terms of the, the level of uh, profits that any company makes depends on a number of international uh, events, some known and some not known. Uh, so clearly there is that level of volatility. Uh, and I think the, the Treasury will want us to have some reserve fund uh, in place to, to deal with that level of uh, volatility. Uh, and we're looking at that uh, issue, which uh, I suspect will require us to have a, a fund somewhere in the, the region of uh, uh, £100 million uh, available. Uh, if we are to go down the, the road of uh, looking at corporation tax, I, I just wish that people wouldn't always look at one column and not look at the other. Uh, let's look at the positives in terms of uh, the, the benefits that flow from corporation tax. Let, let us look at the additional jobs that can be brought into Northern Ireland. Let's look at the international companies who have already come here who will increase their investment in Northern Ireland. Look at the indigenous companies that we have in Northern Ireland that will be able to use increased profits that they will be able to hold on to in order to invest further and to expand their businesses. That means more jobs, it means more spending power. Uh, all of those are the positive aspects which economists have recognised could bring about 50,000 additional jobs to Northern Ireland. So perhaps we can get our, our chins off the ground and start looking at the positive side uh, of bringing corporation tax level uh, uh, powers into it to Northern Ireland rather than always be talking about doom and gloom about our economy. This is a good news story. Thank you. And I call Mrs Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question four, please. The uh, Stormont House uh, Agreement sets uh, out our commitment to look at uh, the proposal for a pension for physically injured victims. A significant amount of background work has already been completed on many elements of a proposed pension. The Victims Commission has been tasked with providing a research report on the issues, and this has now been received by us. However, the report did not deal with the issue of eligibility, other than to look at types and levels of injury. This matter remains outstanding, and it is likely that it will be, a it will be challenging to find consensus on this uh, issue. Officials within our department are currently considering all the issues which need to be addressed in relation to the introduction of a proposal for a pension for severely physically injured victims. Mrs. Hale for supplementary. I thank the First Minister for his answer. And First Minister, you will be aware that many of the injured victims are now elderly and this has become a time urgent issue. You will also be aware that I am bringing forward a private member's bill on this issue and can you give assurance that your department will work collabor collaboratively with me on this case? Well, yes, I, I am aware of the details set out by the member and I commend her for her uh, initiative. Uh, in relation to bringing forward uh, a private member's uh, bill. Uh, and uh, I know from her own background uh, that she feels very strongly about these uh, issues and uh, is keen to do everything that she can to uh, assist. Uh, it, uh, 
I don't expect anything less from the officials uh, in the department, uh, uh, the OFM, DFM department. Uh, we, there are obviously political issues that they will not involve themselves in, but the department will, of course, cooperate in any way that they, they can with the background information that she needs for her bill. And I call Mr. Ross Hussey. I thank the First Minister for his response. Uh, I, too, like members of my party, would be very concerned to see members who were uh, injured as a result of terrorist activity compensated in, in, in respect of a pension. How many people have been identified in the initial sort of soundings that would be re require a pension? The delegation that uh, I received, and it is some months ago, and uh, I suspect their fig figures were right at that time, but it, it was somewhere in the, the region of 300 to 350 uh, were considered to be uh, likely and eligible uh, if the criteria was something similar to that which was uh, initially set out in the consultation document uh, put forward by my friend. I call Mr. Jim Allister. It's clear from what the First Minister says that the stumbling block is the obscene definition which presently exists in relation to a victim. Can the First Minister give an assurance that there are no circumstances in which a victim maker who injured him or herself in the pursuit of terrorism will ever qualify for a pension such as is being discussed here? I think we need to be careful that we don't create a problem for the, the bill as it uh, might come forward. The issue will not be about the definition of victim. The issue will be about the eligibility criteria <coughs> that is set down. There are tens of thousands of victims that are only likely to be three to 350 uh, of those who will be entitled. So it's which of the, those who are defined, even under existing law, as victims are eligible to go, for this, uh, to go forward for this uh, pension. And I think the consultation document that my uh, friend has uh, already published would indicate the, the view that we take on those matters. There are others who have a, another view, and clearly the Assembly is going to have to decide that. But uh, I have no doubt that uh, he and I will probably be in the same lobby on this issue. Thank you. And I call Ms. Paula, Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question five. The reduction in the number of uh, civil service departments and the reorganization of their functions is a program for government commitment. We believe this is uh, an important step towards a more efficient civil service. The reorganization should not be interpreted as a change of executive priorities. It's important to remember that all existing functions will continue to be delivered and resourced within the new departmental context. We fully recognize the importance of culture, arts, and the creative industries. And indeed, we are proud of the esteem in which this sector is held throughout the world. Game of Thrones, for example, is a phenomenal success. Uh, and Boogaloo and Graham winning the short film category at the BAFTAs last week is testimony to Northern Ireland's successful film industry. I call Ms. Paula Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for uh, his answer. And as we know, most of the money for culture and the arts in Northern Ireland is via decal, although there is considerable investment through other uh, agencies, including good relations and community engagement. Can the First Minister confirm that culture and the arts will be integrated within the Together Building United Communities project? Well, there is no change in the direction of any of the programmes as a result of the reduction from 12 departments to nine. The same level of enthusiasm will still be there. In many cases, it will be the same people within the departments uh, who will be moving across to carry out that same work. So it should not affect in any way uh, how that work is uh, carried out. Uh, I, I know that there will be concerns with some if you don't have a particular sector's name and the title of a, a, a department, but whatever those departmental names turn out to, to be, I can give an absolute assurance that it will not in any way dilute that the work that is presently being carried out or the importance that the executive attaches to it. Thank you. And, uh, that ends the period for listed questions, and we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And Mr. Dominic Bradley is not in his place, so I call Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. Last Tuesday, the Culture Minister launched a consultation into what she calls an Irish language bill. 
Did you have the approval of the executive to launch that consultation and ought you to have had that approval given its cross-cutting and controversial nature? No and no. I call Mr Alistair for a supplementary. Is the First Minister saying to us that a minister is at liberty to waste public money on a consultation which doesn't even fit into the programme for government, and he and other executive colleagues who were supposed to have stopped solar runs are impotent to do anything about it? I'm saying that uh, the member should be aware of the distinction between a consultation document and a decision. Uh, any controversial decision has to be taken uh, by the executive, and any minister is required to bring it to the executive. We do have a, a rule that uh, no minister is uh, restricted in any way from going out with a consultation document. Each minister must uh, decide for him or herself the best uses uh, of resources within their department and the likelihood of uh, their consultation being agreeable when it comes back uh, by way of a, a strategy. Uh, that is a, a decision that each minister must take. Uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, I haven't changed my position, nor has my party, uh, on the, the issue. Uh, and uh, I trust that uh, people will respond to the consultation and indicate uh, that uh, there are better ways uh, for us to take forward uh, cultural expression uh, than simply uh, through a, 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 an Irish language uh, act, which has massive expenditure attached to it if we were to go down that particular road. Thank you. And I call Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can the First Minister outline, following the Stormont House Agreement, the importance that he would attach to dealing with issues of the past? Well, I think our, uh, our history in Northern Ireland shows us that no matter how hard we try, uh, the past comes back to trip us up. Uh, and therefore, I think it became vitally important when we sat down to, to deal with a series of issues at the uh, Stormont House discussions, that we tried sensibly uh, to reach agreements where it was possible in relation to the, the past. I am glad that uh, we have uh, reached a series of agreements on how we address those uh, issues, uh, how we can give uh, some hope to uh, victims that they can be heard, uh, some hope to victims that uh, their grievances can be properly uh, pursued. Uh, and that we can seek to get at the truth. Mr. Campbell, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, just on the, dealing with the past, can the First Minister outline what his view is of the former junior minister, uh, Martina Anderson, MEP, who last week talked about the killing and secret burial of Cypriots by Turkish military being wrong, given the context that she was in an organisation that killed, buried, and wouldn't tell people for 20 or 30 years, those like Jean McConville and Columba McVeigh and others. Is that not brass neck, 24 carat hypocrisy at its worst? Well, I'm, I'm sure the, the member, like me, rejoices in the, the fact that uh, the, uh, the member of the European Parliament who made those remarks now recognises uh, the hurt that is caused to, to families who are not aware of uh, the whereabouts uh, or details of their loved ones who were disappeared. Uh, I met recently with the McConville family. Uh, I have to say that uh, it was a very sobering uh, and serious occasion. Uh, here were not just one life lost because uh, of murder, not just the difficulties that arose from that uh, in relation to the body not being discovered for many, many years, but the lives themselves of uh, the family uh, were in many ways ruined, uh, separated at a young age, uh, ending up uh, in Kerr, then finding themselves uh, in circumstances uh, where they were abused uh, as, as children. Uh, I think one can see the, the set of circumstances that they faced so I hope that there is a greater awareness uh, of uh, the, the impact that these have on, on very real individuals. Uh, and if it's right uh, for those uh, who point the finger towards Turkey, it is also right for those who look closer to home. 
Thank you. And I call Mr Mickey Brady. Can the First Minister confirm that four of the five executive parties, the SDLP, DUP, UUP and Alliance, endorsed a provisional welfare agreement on December 17, which did not include a multi-million pound supplementary payment fund, but that the four-party agreement did include a two-year loss of benefit sanction? Well, Mr Speaker, the one thing I can be absolutely certain is that uh, on the, the principle that uh, you never ask a question unless you know the answer, uh, that uh, the, the member does, of course, know that the, the background details to this uh, issue, uh, and of course those uh, facts are accurate. I have to say that uh, I am somewhat disappointed at the attitude of some of the parties in the Assembly towards the issue of uh, welfare reform. Uh, we should be rejoicing that we have managed to resolve an issue that had uh, very real uh, and destructive uh, abilities in terms of the future of this uh, assembly. Uh, and instead of uh, reaching an agreement one day and then trying to either renegotiate it or vote against it or pretend to people outside that you're not really uh, in favour of it, we would all be far better if we were to recognise our responsibilities and move forward in it with an agreement that we reached. I listened open mouthed to the member for Upper Band from the SDLP, uh, Dolores Kelly, on a, a programme uh, at the, the weekend. I could not believe what I was hearing. Now, if the, the member was to do what uh, she should do, and she was to do it at the speed that she should do it, I wouldn't like to be standing between her and the confessional. Because for anybody to suggest, as she did, that her party had not endorsed either the four-party agreement or the five-party agreement is totally misleading, totally misleading. Uh, indeed, uh, the, uh, the facts of it go beyond simply agreeing around the table. We all took that document collectively, five party leaders, down to Stormont uh, House where we sold the idea to the, the Secretary uh, of State and she in turn to the, the Prime Minister. So don't let any party try and wheedle out of agreements that were reached by us all uh, at Stormont Castle. Uh, and I, I think it would do well that we would remember that while there was a four-party agreement, uh, ultimately we agreed a five-party agreement, which was much more detailed, which had much more meat on the bones than the four-party agreement previously had had. Thank you. And I call Mr Mickey Brady for supplementary. I thank the First Minister for his answer, and I hope he doesn't think the supplementary is a rhetorical question. Um, can the Minister further confirm that the multi-million pound supplementary payment fund and a range of protections, including top-ups for children with disabilities, adults with severe disabilities and the long-term sick, was included in the final Stormont Castle Agreement negotiated between the DUP and Sinn Féin and later endorsed by the SDLP, the UUP and the Alliance Party on December the 19th? Well, as I indicated, uh in response to his first question, uh, the five-party agreement at Stormont Castle was much more detailed and precise than the four-party agreement. Uh, I think I can do better. I can confirm to the House that at five minutes to two o'clock before I came into the chamber, I ensured that a copy of the Stormont Castle agreement was placed in the library uh, of uh, the Assembly. Uh, and therefore members will be able to, to look at the question raised by the, the member and satisfy themselves as to what the correct response should be. Thank you. And I call Mr Roy Biggs. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Of the £80 million committed in the Social Investment Fund, only some £6.5 million has to date been committed in the Northern Trust area, a part of which I, I, I live and represent. Uh, but the programme for government originally had that funding being spent within its period, which you understand will run out in six weeks' time. So can the First Minister advise us what is the timescale for this uh, subsequent funding, which is now only hitting the ground? Well, I, I think the member should look at the precise wording he uses and chooses language more carefully. He said of the £80 million pounds uh, only six point whatever it was uh, had been allocated to his area. There was not £80 million pounds for his area. £80 million pounds was for the whole of Northern Ireland, both capital 
and revenue. A small fraction of that was uh, for each of the, uh, the zones. Uh, I'm glad to hear from him that uh, the commitments have already been made in his area. I think a lot of this is rolling out much more slowly than uh, we would want and are comfortable with. Uh, I have two cases from my own advice centre uh, on Friday that I intend to, to raise with colleagues about the slow movement within uh, either the Department of Finance or OFM, DFM. Uh, so uh, I am at one with them in wanting to speed the, the process uh, up, but it is important that we have the proper checks in place because we are dealing with public money and we want to ensure that it is uh, being used properly. I call Mr Beggs for supplement. I, I thank the First Minister for his, his answer, but I think if he reflects on Hansard, he will see that I never said that £80 million was expected in the Northern Trust area. I was simply reflecting on the total amount. But uh, would he not acknowledge that it has been very slow to get the ground? And can he tell us what time frame will this be delivered and when uh, disadvantaged members in my constituency can expect to see some benefit from it? Well, Hansard will show that what he said was of the £80 million, pounds, only six odd million pounds in his area, giving, clearly implying that a very small amount of the £80 million pounds had been assigned uh, to, to his, his area. There, there was a division among the zones. We have had countless discussions in this uh, assembly uh, since then. Nobody has complained that uh, we got it out of kilter in terms of the division of that money across the, the, the zones. Of course we want it to happen as quickly uh, as possible. And if the member wants to write to me or come to see me about any particular project he has in his constituency, I'm quite happy to uh, bring forward our officials, or indeed officials from uh, finance and personnel, to discuss at what stage the, the issue is at the present time, what can be done to speed up any particular project. Thank you. And I call Mr Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Further to the question earlier on about international relations, can the First Minister confirm that the Bureau office in Brussels has four desk officers and one head of department? Can the First Minister outline what benefits does he hope to accrue over the next four years in relationship to our relationships with Brussels going forward? Mr Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask my colleague, Junior Minister Jonathan Bell, to answer this question. Well, in, in relation to the work that we have been uh, doing with the uh, desk officers, uh, it ranges uh, across a variety uh, of areas um, from climate change through to energy to uh, competitiveness and employment. And what the success uh, of having the desk officers is that strategic approach that they are taking to building the contacts, contacts within the European Union to maximise the drawdown uh, of funding uh, for people here, for small and medium enterprises here, uh, and also for uh, businesses here. The work that they have been undertaking, both uh, with groups and, and with businesses, has always been critical about trying to ensure that the very complex European legislation, which would make a, a small business here, small and medium enterprise, it would be extremely difficult to plow their way through that. Uh, in many cases, from examples that I have seen, it is about making that work manageable and making sure that people get timely information at the correct time as to what they are eligible for. There are major funds out there that are simply overwhelming uh, when they are looked at in the first instance, but when they are broken down almost to chunk size, there are opportunities for Northern Ireland businesses here. That's just one example of some of the positive work that they're doing. Uh, we're almost out of time, but for a very quick supplementary. Yeah, I think the junior minister for his answer. Would he accept, however, that we need to maximise the opportunities that are coming out of Brussels? And would he further agree with me that Mr Jerry Mulligan has done a wonderful job? And can he confirm that he has been replaced by a new civil servant, civil servant from Northern Ireland? Yes, I can, and I would also join in, in paying tribute to uh, Jerry Mulligan, every time that uh, I went out and have been out numerous times, uh, there has been a comprehensive programme that has been put in place, and we look for that work to be continued uh, underneath the successor there. And there has been some major work that has been done with Jerry. I mean, last week we were dealing with uh, Safer Internet Day. 
When we were out uh, previously, we got to speak to some of the key influencers in the European Union in terms of safer internet, in terms of trying to ensure that those who provide the material onto the internet are actually held accountable uh, for what they do. The second example is we went to look at the apprenticeships uh, that were available, particularly around Germany and particularly around Austria, to see what we could do, because I know the member will agree with me uh, that too many of our young people are not in education, in employment or in training. But yet what we are seeing is there are countries in Europe, particularly around regions uh, in Austria and in Germany, that are providing their young people with a different way forward and young people who are actively engaging uh, with proper apprenticeships leading to full-time jobs at the end of them, particularly around and in the engineering industry. And one of the things that uh, Jerry did with the support of the desk officers was to ensure that we could take all of that and uh, make sure that we could maximise the potential for Northern Ireland. Thank you, and I thought you were going to destroy your voice there. <laughs> uh, that brings us to the end of our topical questions. We must now move on to questions.